Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Satirius Johnson. This episode is all about history. We'll delve into California's storied past and how you can experience it today, starting in San Francisco with author and tour guide Gary Camilla. One thing that's a delightful place that gives you a real sweep of San Francisco history and is also just such a pleasure to go to is to walk up to the top of Telegraph Hill and visit Coit Tower. Then Robert Peterson, host of the Hidden History of Los Angeles podcast, shares some of the stories you aren't likely to hear anywhere else. Take a walk down Broadway and see some of the most beautiful old buildings in the city. There's the Bradbury Building from 1893, which has been featured in movies such as Blade Runner and 100 Days of Summer, and which was actually created in part thanks to a Ouija board. And Bill Lawrence of the San Diego History Center in Balboa Park tells us where to go to appreciate California history from early inhabitants to the present era of innovation. That's all coming up on California Now. In San Francisco, you can explore a wide variety of not just cultures, but chapters of history, often within a few short blocks of each other. From Chinatown to Spanish and Mexican influences to the gold rush, my next guest can tell you exactly where to go to soak it all in. Gary Camilla writes about history for the San Francisco Chronicle, gives walking tours, and has written two books about the city. Welcome to California Now, Gary. Thank you, Soterius. Good to be here. So, you know, to start out, your newest book is called Spirits of San Francisco, Voyages Through the Unknown City. Tell us a bit about it. Well, it's a uh, a collaboration with a wonderful artist named Paul Madonna, who uh, does just fantastic line drawings. So this was a full and equal collaboration with his spectacular drawings of 16 different sites in San Francisco And then I did these kind of deep dives into each of these sites, uh, historically, personally, what they look like, what their atmosphere is like. And they're all over the map, everything from the most iconic and famous places in the city, like Lombard Street or the Palace of Fine Arts, to really obscure corners in gritty south of market intersections or strange houses on enormous rock foundations. So we tried to give a really a kaleidoscopic and uh, far-ranging view of San Francisco. That's really great. We're going to get into that. We're going to hear about all, all these really great places. Um, but I wanted to, to talk about your previous book as well before we go there. Um, you know, that was the award-winning Cool Gray City of Love, 49 Views of San Francisco. What do you think made that book such a success? It is both kind of a walking tour in a sense. This book actually is 49 different chapters, as the subtitle implies, 49 different sites in San Francisco, so that it's very spatial in a sense. It's, it, it's, you can walk through the city with the book and you can visit all these sites, but at the same time, it also provides an entire history of the city going all the way back to geological time, then running through the in the days when giant Colombian mammoths walked the streets of, of, there were no streets, walked San Francisco, and then into the Spanish and Mexican eras, the gold rush, and all the way up to the present day. Yeah, I mean, San Francisco is such an incredible place. Um, It's got way too much history for us to try to fit into just one segment here. But let's highlight a few chapters and places around town that you'd like to show people, maybe starting with the city's Spanish history and Portsmouth Square. Yeah, well, Portsmouth Square is kind of historical ground zero for the entire early history of San Francisco. Um, So it's uh, this wonderful sort of decrepit square. It's It's right between Chinatown and the financial district. So it's got this very unusual location. And today, uh, in effect, it's, it's often called Chinatown's living room. Because the the people in Chinatown, you know, live in extremely close quarters, so they when they want to go outside, they hang out there. But yeah, uh, it, when you go back to San Francisco's earliest history, after the after the of course the long period of the native peoples, the Spanish got here in 1776, and they uh, settled. Uh, they were in the Presidio and in the Mission Dolores. Um, they didn't have much to do with this part of town that became downtown San Francisco. That really uh, enters San Francisco history, Portsmouth Square, which was called the Plaza, 
enters San Francisco history during the Mexican era, which begins in 1821 and ends in 1846. And the Mexicans opened up trading to the so-called Boston traders. They opened up uh, the, the, the cattle uh, ranches in the area so that um, they could trade with the Americans coming from Boston. And in Portsmouth Square, they had their customs house. So that this became the, really the center of this tiny little hamlet that was not called San Francisco yet. It was called Yerba Buena. And uh, so that was the, sort of the, for, for, what, for what the little tiny sleepy end of the world hamlet was, this was kind of the main part of, of Yerba Buena was Portsmouth Square. And then, you know, going ahead when the gold rush hits, and there's this sort of psychedelic explosion of people rushing into San Francisco. Portsmouth Square is the center of that, too, lined with gambling dens and saloons and houses of prostitution. So it becomes this, you know, this real epicenter of really one of the craziest uh, cities in the history of the world. <laughs> it's almost like, you know, Portsmouth Square is where it all started in a way. I mean, it was like the seed of what became San Francisco later. Exactly. And, and the, 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 there's a lovely place you can physically see that when you visit Portsmouth Square, you just walk one block away uh, onto Grant Avenue, the heart of Chinatown. It's filled with, uh, you know, shops and selling trinkets and, and Chinese goods and all different kinds of things. And uh, right there on Grant Avenue, uh, behind, uh, usually there's a rack of T-shirts and some other stuff. And there's an old plaque that says the birthplace of a great city and <laughs> black announces that this is where an English whaler, a sailor named William Richardson built the very first structure in the city that was to become San Francisco. It was actually just a lean to made out of a ship's mast with canvas sails for walls. And he and his family built this. There was nothing there. It was only at like two or three blocks from the uh, cove. It was two or three blocks from the water at that time. And that was really where San Francisco started. So it's a, it's a delightfully sort of forgotten plaque. And that this really is, was the beginning of the city of San Francisco is just, that's one block off Portsmouth Square. That's really cool. So, so if I were to go to Port, Portsmouth Square today, what would I see? And, and what do you point out to people when you're there? Well, you, you'll, one of the main things that you see when you're kind of in the north end of the square, there's a large flagpole, an American flag uh, pole with, the, you know, flying. And that was right near the site of the old Mexican customs house, which uh, was, uh, uh, bec was the place where, after the United States conquered uh, Mexico uh, during the Mexican-American War, and when San Francisco was conquered, uh, the uh, USS Portsmouth, which the square was named after, pulled up in the harbor, and a bunch of Marines marched right to that flagpole and raised the American flag there um, in front of what are reported to be a large group of people that quickly became very drunk. <laughs> so there's <laughs> that, and that that was that was the site, as I say, of the old um, the old Mexican Customs House, which got turned into a U.S. barracks. So that's something that's, you know, fascinating. Okay, where do we go next? I mean, I, I feel it's just a short walk to Jackson Square, right? So what, what parts of history do you go into there? Yeah, well, it's, it's, the, uh, it's called the Jackson Square Historic District. And um, so, yeah, it's just a couple blocks down from, from Portsmouth Square. And this is a wonderful uh, place to explore. It's, it's very compact. You can walk it in just, you know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, you walk sort of down Jackson Street and up Pacific. And what you get uh, when you start, let's say, at Jackson and Montgomery Streets is you get this uh, incredible collection, the finest collection left in San Francisco, of Gold Rush era buildings. This neighborhood evokes the Gold Rush uh, more than any other place. This you know, unique architecture of, of the uh, 1850s and 60s there's a number of buildings that survived there. Very, very few buildings survived from that era in San Francisco because of the 1906 earthquake, but a number of them did. And you can see some, uh, you know, really fascinating things. For example, you're walking along uh, Jackson Street, and right in the corner of Jackson and Montgomery is an old brick bank where William Sherman the uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, the famous Civil War general, 
before he was a Civil War general, he was a banker in San Francisco. And this um, he later <laughs> issued one of the greatest quotes about, about San Francisco real estate. He said, I can handle an army of 100,000 men and take the city of the sun, meaning Atlanta, which he famously sacked. But I am afraid to manage a, a lot in the swamp that is San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> he got he got involved in in business transactions in San Francisco, and as many uh, later <laughs> investors discovered, that could be a very dicey proposition. But uh, it's uh, <laughs> there's a lovely there's a that, there's, so there's a lovely building there. That's the very same corner also evokes this wonderful period of San Francisco history. Really, my favorite in a way which is the Yerba Buena years. This is sort of under Mexican control and before the gold rush. So it begins when William Richardson sets up that lean-to in 1835, and it ends in 1846 when the U.S. Uh, conquers California in, in, in the Mexican-American War. But this period, the Yerba Buena years, is so delightful because it's just filled with these eccentric characters who sort of washed up at this end of the world, and people forget how remote and hard it was to get to San Francisco. So it was not, you know, you couldn't just easily show up in San Francisco. It was one of the hardest places to get to. And there was just this eccentric collection of oddballs. Uh, they had a tendency to drink heavily. There was a lot of cultural intermarriage, which made it fascinating. There's another gorgeous building called the Hoteling Building, uh, that was a liquor warehouse, a whiskey warehouse, and it was saved uh, during the fire, which inspired maybe the best piece of doggerel ever written in San Francisco. A wag wrote, if, as some say, God spanked the town for being over frisky, why did he <laughs> burn the churches down? And leave <laughs> O'Talling's whiskey. <laughs> so, and that plaque is actually up on that building um, on, on Jackson Street. Anyway, there's, lot, there's lots of, of great remnants of the gold rush on Jackson and Pacific Streets. Wow. So let, let's hit one more stop, maybe North Beach. Um, what makes that neighborhood so special? North Beach has two things that are just wonderful. I mean, number one, it's just a spectacular neighborhood in San Francisco, the feng shui of it. It's it, the way that it's laid out between Telegraph and Russian Hills is really special. It just gives it a special atmosphere. And, and then the two things that are really wonderful historically about it is first, it was the center of Little Italy, which began in the, you know, about the 1880s and its heyday was, you know, it sort of peaked in about 1935. But for this 50 year period or so, it's astonishing how profoundly Italian, how insular, ingrown, how much Italian businesses that, you know, only Italian would be spoken. Um, and there were dozens of pasta factories. There were uh, vendors selling their goods on the street. Uh, one of the most eminent San Francisco historians, Richard Dillon, says that in many ways, San Francisco's Little Italy was more intensely Italian even than New York's Little Italy. So it's a, uh, it had a wonderful, uh, wonderful history of this uh, fascinating uh, ethnic group with, with all of its, you know, wonderful cultural interests. They had, a, you know, accordion makers. There were many, many Italian newspapers. Uh, so there's, there's all of that rich history. And, and it's still uh, reflected um, in, in the number of Italian uh, restaurants and, and businesses in the area. So it's just, it's a, it's got a rich history in that sense. And then the other a uh, thing that's so fascinating about North Beach, it was the epicenter of the beats of the great uh, countercultural movement that preceded the hippies that began in the um, in the early 1950s. Right. And, you know, there was the beats had various places where they howled and wandered in New York and and Paris and different. But San Francisco was was one of was one of the main heart and soul parts of the beat movement and North Beach, Upper Grant Avenue was where they, where, where they gathered. And there are still um, built the buildings uh, that, that were places like the place, you know, that's, that's an existing place in Upper Grant, the Cafe Trieste, uh, which opened in 1956. 
Um, that's still very much there. That's a very famous uh, sort of bohemian, wonderful mm. coffee house where, uh, you know, it's got rich history, like Francis Ford Coppola wrote The Godfather sitting there. Right. And City Lights Bookstore is still there, right? I mean, and that's such City a great Lights place. City Lights Bookstore, which opened in 1953, and, you know, where that was after Allen Ginsberg delivered his famous reading of Howl on the other side of town, the owner, the proprietor of City Lights, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, famously, you know, you know, said, I, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Well, you know, we're going to have to wrap up soon, Gary. But before we do, what's one last place uh, people might overlook? But if you want to appreciate some San Francisco history, you really have to, you know, take a look at it. Well, I think one thing that's uh, a delightful place that that gives you a real sweep of San Francisco history and is also just such a pleasure to go to is to walk up to the top of Telegraph Hill and visit Coit Tower. Um, Coit Tower was, uh, you know, built by an eccentric heiress, uh, Lily Hitchcock Coit, um, in the 30s, and it has these magnificent WPA era murals inside it that are very left wing. They're very influenced by Diego Rivera. So they, they capture that whole ethos of the city of that time. And then from Coit Tower, you can look down on the waterfront of San Francisco. You can actually look all over the whole bay. So, uh, it, and it's just beautiful up there. So that's, that's another uh, place I would recommend. Well, Gary, you know, this has really been great. I feel like we're only scratching the surface of your knowledge. I, I think I'm really going to have to read your books and uh, book a walking tour or two. No, oh, well, I'd be delighted, and I, I hope you uh, hope you enjoy the books. Thanks so much for joining us in California now. Thank you very much. Gary Camilla is the author, most recently, of Spirits of San Francisco, Voyages Through the Unknown City, which you can find online or in your favorite bookshop. You can learn more about Gary at GaryCamilla.com. And as always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, VisitCalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Los Angeles is an incredible place to explore history, particularly when you know where to go and what to look for. My next guest has dedicated an entire podcast to showcasing some of the lesser-known characters who've populated the region, as well as some stories that may not make it into most history books. Robert Peterson is a third-generation Angelino and host of the Hidden History of Los Angeles podcast. Welcome to California Now, Robert. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell us about your podcast. How did you get the idea to focus on L.A.'s hidden history? Well, I've been obsessed with L.A. history for a long time. Uh, all four of my grandparents moved here in the 1930s. So growing up, I always heard stories about L.A.'s past. You know, everything from my grandmother taking the Pico Street car with her nicest clothes to the Bullock's Wilshire Tea Room or my <laughs> dad going to watch uh, old Hollywood star games, uh, minor league baseball before the Dodgers came at Gilmore Field where the Grove is now. And a lot of these stories I didn't hear elsewhere. So um, that started the bug in me. And then in college, I, I, I studied uh, L.A. history. And with all this maybe obsessive uh, interest, I needed a place to put it. So I started a podcast a few years ago, and it's just been a great outlet for me to uh, put my love for the city and the city's history out there. Well, your podcast is, is kind of filling that, that niche, which is really great. Um, and I love how the show has a few different gears. I mean, like sometimes you interview authors, other times you employ voice actors to tell your stories. It's really great uh, the way you're kind of mixing it all up. Great. Thank you. So uh, let's talk about a few specific episodes and the stories behind them. I, I see you have an episode organized around the proper way to pronounce <laughs> Los Angeles. <laughs> I had no idea this was actually ever an issue. Um, what's the story there? So, of course, when this city was founded, it was founded by people who spoke Spanish. So they use the Spanish pronunciation of the city, Los Angeles. And that's the way it was for several decades. But when there was an influx of English-speaking uh, settlers, then there started to be a bigger problem of how we're going to pronounce the name of the city. A lot of people you know, argued for kind of anglicized pronunciations. But even then, we weren't sure what uh, – there was no consensus about what the anglicized pronunciation should be. Should it be a hard G, Los Angeles? or soft G, Los Angeles, or Los Angeles, Los Angeles. And this debate went on for about a century. Uh, finally, in 1952, the mayor of the city at the time, Fletcher Bowen, impaneled a jury of experts to once and for all settle the question. You know, our little, our once little Pueblo had grown to become the third largest city in the country, but people were still unsure about what to call it. 
So a final decision was needed, a panel of experts was put together, and they proclaimed an official pronunciation of the city, and the winner was Los Angeles. Interestingly, Fletcher Bowen himself might have been a little dismayed because he was a hard G man. He said Los Angeles. So he, the mayor <laughs> even had to say it, change how he pronounced the name of the city. And we're pretty set on the anglicized version of Los Angeles. Uh, there's still other parts of the city like Los Feliz, uh, San Pedro or San Pedro uh, that still we and Santa Ana, Santa Ana. Uh, hmm. We still struggle with uh, finding consensus of how to pronounce some of the names. And, you know, you also have an episode addressing why there are so many peacocks in the city of Arcadia, which first I have to ask for people who haven't been, peacocks roam free in Arcadia, right? They roam free. And not only that, they actually, by law in Arcadia, have the right of way. So if you're driving down the street, (laughs) you have to stop for the peacock. And that's not just a funny law. That is actually the practice in the city. And I grew up in Pasadena right nearby where we get peacocks too. And you will be driving down a five-lane 50 mile an hour street and five or six peacocks will walk right down and everybody stops. How did that come to be? Well, one man is responsible for all of those peacocks, a man named <laughs> Lucky Baldwin. And um, he brought, he had a ranch in what is now Arcadia and he brought uh, a series of uh, peacocks in the 1880s. And all the peacocks in Arcadia that we see today, there's hundreds of them, all come from that original batch from India in the 1880s. That's really funny. I, every so often, do they kind of put on a show? Do they like unfurl their tail or, or how, you know, it must, that must be pretty cool. Yes. During uh, mating season, uh, the men, so the men are the peacocks and the females are the peafowl. Uh, and the men, uh, you know, do that little dance and they actually shake. And it's, it's really, <laughs> I find it fascinating <laughs> and I love it. I love peacocks. Uh, my wife thinks they're a little strange looking, but I absolutely <laughs> love peacocks and I, I love funny. watching them during that season. Mm. Let's talk about one of L.A.'s quirkiest attractions for a minute, Angel's Flight. What is Angel's Flight and what sparked that episode? Angel's Flight was this tiny, people at the time called it the world's shortest train, but it's not. But it's it's this tiny funicular that takes people from the bottom of Bunker Hill to the top of Bunker Hill. It was closed for several decades, but it's it's about a century old, and it's this great little remnant of old Los Angeles that you can still take today. And beyond being fun, and I don't know how many people have actually been on a funicular, it's also uh, useful because you can still today, there's still a, a hill to go from, you know, from Grand Central Market at the bottom to Bunker Hill at the top. And I think for a lot of Angelinos, it's very special. Like when they opened it back up, I was very happy because, you know, my grandparents took Angel's Flight. My parents took Angel's Flight. I took Angel's Flight. And now my kids could take Angel's Flight. Yeah. Can you describe what it looks like or what it's like when you're actually on it? So it's two little rail trains. It's it's a it's an incline railway. And they actually, one goes up while one goes down. And they, they use, I guess, this pulley system that basically works with both of them. So one train is at the top, one train is at the bottom, and then they go up and switch uh, sides. And incline railways and funiculars were very popular, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Los Angeles had several of them. We even had one in the mountains up above the San Gabriels, up above Altadena. Uh, obviously now not so much, but it's still, again, uh, this great little piece of history and really fun to ride. And I'm sure you probably get some pretty nice views going on the on the way up, right? Yeah, De- yeah, definitely. And at the top, it's it's really great because uh, you're when you get to the top of Angel Flight, you are in Bunker Hill of today. You know, it's surrounded by uh, skyscrapers and very buildings that were built in the 80s and 90s. And then you look down, and you see the old downtown of Los Angeles, and you can even see LA's first skyscraper, which was built near the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so it's a nice, it's a really nice experience because I feel like you get to see a little bit of the new downtown Los Angeles, while also then you can see a, a nice view of the old downtown Los Angeles. What, what's something that surprised you personally in working on this over the last few years? You know, people talk about, you know, the Wild West uh, uh, in movies, but L.A. was actually the Wild West. Mm. I mean, it was a very violent uh, town. Uh, and that's something that did surprise me a little bit in researching episodes. Yeah, I mean, that's something you definitely don't think about when you think of L.A. I mean, you might think of it somewhere like in the desert of California or somewhere else. But, you know, Los Angeles just comes across as like cosmopolitan city. Uh, you know, you just would never think that that history is there. Definitely. Do, do, do you see boning up on history before you visit a destination a good way to do some maybe some trip planning? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um 
I, I get asked a lot, uh, you know, for ideas for, for where to go when visiting Los Angeles. And um, I think two things. Um, one, you mentioned boning up and, and, and learning a little bit about the history and also focusing on what you want to see. Uh, because LA has a lot of different things for different people. And some people want to see Rodeo Drive. Some people couldn't care less. Uh, some people want to see the, the, you know, where all their favorite TV shows or, or, or films were or filmed and some of the filming locations. Some people don't care. Uh, you know, I was thinking uh, I had a friend visit who was obsessed with Disney. So I, you know, gave him a little tour of, of some of the great Disney history. You know, start off a day with a sandwich at Gelson Supermarket in Silver Lake which was the location of the Walt Disney Studios and the birthplace of Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, and Snow White. Then you can walk a couple blocks and see Walt Disney's house. Then drive to the merry-go-round at Griffith Park, where Walt Disney came up with the idea for Disneyland. Hmm. And then grab dinner at Walt's favorite restaurant, the Tam O'Shanter, which opened in 1922, and you can actually sit in Walt's favorite booth. That's the type of, you know, you can have that experience in L.A. You just need to do a little pre-planning uh, but whatever you're interested in, you can find it in Los Angeles. So are there any specific tours that you like to point people toward or that you've taken yourself that you've just really enjoyed? One thing when people ask me for recommendations, you know, visiting L.A., I often tell people, you know, start off the day maybe at Grand Central Market in downtown Los Angeles, which is this old food court, which opened in 1917 with dozens of different vendors, great food, whether you want Salvadoran pupusas or, you know, uh, hipster eggs, they have it all. Then you can take a walk down Broadway and see some of the most beautiful old buildings in the city. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of there's the Bradbury building from 1893, which has been featured in movies such as Blade Runner and 100 Days of Summer, and which was actually created in part thanks to a Ouija board. Uh, great backstory to the building. And then you can go down Broadway and there's a dozen classic old movie theaters that were built between 1910 and 1930, which are gorgeous. And then from there, you can wander a little bit, wander around downtown. Uh, you know, there's some great old restaurants, bars, uh, King Eddie Saloon, uh, which is a couple blocks away, which has, you know, has actually uh, underground speakeasy, uh, which has also been around since the, the beginning of the century, which also was a hangout for uh, apparently for Charles Bukowski and uh, John Fonte, another great L.A. writer. So that's the type of thing that I, I usually suggest when people want to visit L.A., something like that, where they can, you know, see a few sites, walk a little bit and explore a little bit. Uh, and if you're into more of a if you don't want to do like a do it yourself tour, there are great tours. And, and when I would recommend would be a tour company called Esso Torque, which is run by two great local historians, uh, Kim Cooper and Richard Shave. And they have every type of tour you could think of. If you're into interested in the Black, Black Dahlia murder, other true crime, the Manson murders, uh, architecture, they have a tour for it. Uh, one tour that I've heard that people love is uh, they have a tour called Haunts of a Dirty Old Man, Charles Bukowski's LA. And I think it's Mostly people who love Charles Bukowski, but they they take you everywhere. They take you to where the postal annex terminal where he gathered the material for his book, the post office. Uh, they take you to his house where he lived. They take you to where he bought beer. They take you to all the different pl places that that show up in his writing. And if you're a Charles Bukowski fan, I mean, I can't imagine a better tour for you. That is so great. I mean, do, do, you, do you get a sense that that general interest in Los Angeles history has been growing in recent years? I think so. Um, you know, when I was in college in the late 90s, I remember, you know, I was really getting into L.A. history and there were a handful of great books. Uh, but it didn't seem it seems like since then there is just this growth of interest in L.A. history. Uh, there's so many more people writing about L.A. history. There's, you know, podcasts. There's uh documentaries there's tv shows you know i'm thinking kcet did this great uh show lost la with nathan masters a, another great uh local historian um there's just a lot of interest in la history now and and it's great i, I it's, it's frankly i feel like it's such an exciting time to to uh dig into la history because first of all there's just great stuff out there to to, to read and to learn about but then there's also a lot of things that are still undiscovered so uh, there, there's still a lot of room to be surprised well Robert this has really been great um, thank you so much for joining us on California now thanks so much for having me 
Robert Peterson hosts and produces the Hidden History of Los Angeles podcast. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts and check out the website at hiddenhistoryla.com. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. From its first inhabitants to the present era of innovation, San Diego is a world-class destination for history, with incredible places where you can explore it both indoors and out. Here to tell us about a few of those stops is Bill Lawrence. He's president and CEO of the San Diego History Center. Welcome to California Now, Bill. Thank you, Cesarius. It's a real pleasure to be here. So let's start with the San Diego History Center. Uh, You actually operate two museums. Um, What are they and where are they? Uh, That's correct. Our two museums are located in National Register Historic Parks here in San Diego. And Presidio Park is our historic home where we operate the Sarah Museum on behalf of the citizens and visitors to San Diego. And then our um, main center and research archive is located in Balboa Park, which is the jewel of uh, San Diego culture and art and history and science. And um, we're very, very fortunate. It's a absolutely gorgeous park. We, co- we consider it the Smithsonian of the West. I'm going to ask you more about the, the Sarah Museum a little later. But first, Balboa Park, you know, it really is one of the iconic San Diego places. I mean, what makes your museum there special? Well, we actually um, connect the past to the present and set the stage for the dialogues about where is a community San Diego wants to go in the future. So our focus is on the culture of San Diego and how we have become the eighth largest city in the nation. Hmm. So how are you going to do it? (laughs) <laughs> How do we do it? Well, we do it in a, in a, in a variety of, of ways. First, we utilize our collections, which is absolutely amazing. We have two and a half million photographs that document the city and how it's grown over the last 200 plus years. We uh, do it through objects and we do it through stories of community. And really, we are a central community place where the community can tell its own history and its own stories. So San Diego is really a, a, a very diverse melting pot. And not only that, we're on the border with Mexico. Uh, Tijuana used to be part of our region. We were all one area before San Diego became part of the United States. So really, it is um, allowing the community to tell its own story. Right. So I, I'd like to, to touch on a few different parts of San Diego history that contribute to the the city that we see today, starting before Europeans showed up. So what what can you tell me about the sort of cultural history of the people of that era? Well, the um, prior to the European settlement of San Diego, and San Diego is the first Euro- European settlement in what becomes California on the West Coast, um, the Kumeyaay are the native, the first people of the region. Uh, Their um, archaeological data goes back 12,000 or more years. In their culture, they have actually inhabited this place since time immemorial. So they are the first peoples of the area. They continue to be people who occupy the region. San Diego has more federally recognized tribal nations than any other county in the country. That's pretty amazing. And, and, And they still have you know, land that they live on and as part of like a reservation or something? Yes, uh, they do. And there and there are, um, I think there are over 20, maybe 22 federally recognized reservations. And this um, and many of the of the tribes have amazing cultural centers. One is uh, the Barona uh, Band of Mission Indians. They have a cultural center that actually tells their own story in their own words. A major landmark uh, from California's Spanish era is the Sarah Museum, which you mentioned uh, the History Center operates. What can I see there? The Sarah Museum was built in 1929. It's a Spanish revival architecture, but it was built specifically to be a museum and to house my organization and our collections. What is most amazing, though, is the ruins of the Presidio are directly below our museum. And they are considered to be the best preserved of any of the missions of the 21 missions in California because they are 
they are underground, they are buried, and they are done specifically that to preserve them. But you can come to our museum and you can see um, a virtual recreation of what the Presidio looked like, as well as hear the stories and view the area of why San Diego and why the, the mission was established and the Presidio was established where it was. And what are, what are some of the, like, the other exhibits there that tend to be popular with visitors? The AR is very popular with the younger audience. Um, one of the things that is most interesting, I think, to many of our visitors is hearing from the people themselves. So we have members of the Kumeyaay, we have historians, we have Spanish descendants that talk about really the sacred nature of this place and why it's important in the, not only the history of San Diego and California, but in the history of our nation. And why is it important? It's important because it is really um, the melting pot of what becomes the West Coast and with westward expansion in the 1800s, um, you know, part of the United States of America. You know, one of the themes for San Diego history might be where it all started. And I think a prime example of that is Cabrillo National Monument. Uh, For people who don't know it, why is it significant? Well, Cabrillo National Monument is a great place to get your first view of San Diego. It is on the point of Point Loma. It's not exactly where the first ships landed, but it, it recognizes the Spanish coming to San Diego and this region by ship. Um, it's a great place to get a view of the city. It is one of the most spectacular viewpoints looking back on the city and seeing how San Diego has, is the eighth largest city in the nation. It's also a great place to get a view of the military um, because it lays out before you all of San Diego Bay and where, and also North Island where the um, aircraft carriers are located. A little bit of trivia about Cabrillo National Monument is that um, during the Cold War, it was uh, considered the place where the Russian spies would go to look upon San Diego's uh, submarine fleet. Yeah. And follow their uh, voyages. Right, right. So, so a nice view for spies at the time. At the time, it's still <laughs> it's still one of the best views in in the county. I think it's hard to miss what an influence the military has had in shaping San Diego. Why is that? Well, it's because it's been part of our DNA from the very beginning, at mm-hmm. least with the European settlement. Um, you know, San Diego was discovered in I believe 1542. Um, and again, I'm terrible at dates, so forgive me if I'm, I get some of these slightly wrong. My, Plus or minus a couple of years. It's okay. Yeah, my, my historian <laughs> friends will correct me and let me know. But um, from the, the San Diego, really, and the, and the Presidio was established in 1769 as a military fortress. So even with the, the arrival of the Spanish, it's partially military related. Jump ahead to the United States. Um, in 1850, when California becomes part of the United States and San Diego becomes part of the United States, we um, we have a military contingent that that views this as very important to the safety and uh, the progress of the United States of America. So where else could I go to explore some of that military history? Um, there's so much of it in San Diego. Where are some really good like highlights that people who are into military history really need to visit? The first place I would recommend is um, the San Diego Bayfront. We have a, a wonderful institution, the San Diego Maritime Museum, that has a series of great exhibits and ships that you can actually go on. The Midway Museum is one of the five best museums in the entire country. And those are all based right here in San Diego. And it's an easy place to go. I would also say, go to Liberty Station, which previously was the Naval Training Center, Mm -hmm. which is now an arts district. There are some great things to see there to celebrate the military history. One of my favorites, lesser known uh, things that you can see is the USS Recruit which was a training vessel for the Navy. Some great places to see military history. Um, the MCRD has a recruit depot, has a, uh, has a Marine Corps museum. Um, Miramar does as well. 
San Diego used to be Fighter Town USA with the Top Gun. You, you may remember the, the first Top Gun movie with Tom Cruise. Right. Um, Miramar and Fighter Town USA, where Top Gun was shot and done and the training occurred, is now for the Marine Corps. And then there's the San Diego Air and Space Museum, too, right? So that's another kind of almost branch that you can visit. Yes, the Air and Space Museum is located here in Balboa Park, and it is a great um, experience as well. You know, t- today San Diego County is known as kind of a hub of innovation and in everything from microchips to craft brewing. Um, is that spirit of innovation part of the region's DNA? Absolutely. Um, life sciences um, is a huge part. Um, the Salk Institute is a great place to have a view of the ocean and also learn about um, the biotech industry in San Diego and the life sciences. Qualcomm is ever, we would not have our cell phones today without the innovation that has happened in the communication industry, the cell phone industry. Um, we also have innovation in world class craft brewing. Uh, San Diego is now known internationally as a major player in the beer industry. Um, we have innovation in business. Um, there would not be a Costco today without the predecessor to that price club and the innovations that Saul Price uh, created in, in business and in retailing. So the DNA of San Diego is very much ingrained with this idea of innovation. It largely comes from the uh, university environments that are here. We have world-class universities. It comes from the military uh, presence that we have. And it comes from just people loving to come here, settling here, and contributing to the community and making the making not only San Diego, but California and our world a better place. Well, Bill, this has really been great. I, I know I am overdue for a return visit to San Diego, and I'm definitely going to you know add some stops to my itinerary based on what we talked about today. So thanks so much for joining us on California Now. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to hosting you and having you here in San Diego. Sounds great. Bill Lawrence is president and CEO of the San Diego History Center, online at sandiegohistory.org. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. We hope you enjoyed this episode and get a chance to hit the road soon. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find our show on iTunes and Stitcher. Please subscribe. And please check our website for the latest in the way of state travel advisories. It's visitcalifornia.com.